It is one of humanity's epic journeys. Thousands of years ago, people first came out of the wild and formed civilization. They would build huge monuments, like the pyramids and all the great cities of the ancient world. But why did they do it? What forces gave birth to civilization? <laughs> For years, archaeologists have been trying to get back to when it all began, to find the answer. And now at last it seems they may have done it. For they are now exploring a lost city of pyramids in Peru. It is nearly 5,000 years old. And the story it tells about why we embarked on this great journey is more extraordinary than anyone had ever expected. Peru's desert coast, trapped between the Andes Mountains and the Pacific Ocean. Nothing survives out here. Explorers once hurried through in search of the gold and the treasures of the Incas hidden in the mountains beyond. But no one stopped. But then, seven years ago, somebody did. Ruth Shaggy had heard of some mysterious unexplained mounds and, alone, set off through the desert to find them. And then, right in the middle of this dead land, she found this. A huge hill rising out of the desert. When I first arrived in the valley in 1994, I was overwhelmed. This place is somewhere between the seat of the gods and the home of man. It is a very strange place. Then, as she looked closer, she thought she could see something hidden under the rubble and stones. In her mind's eye, she could make out the faintest outline of a pyramid. And as she looked around, she could see another, and then another. Ruth Shardy had stumbled on a lost city. It was a discovery that would stun the world of archaeology, because it would finally begin to solve one of the great unanswered questions. Why our ancestors abandoned the life of simplicity and started down the road to civilization. Today's modern city is the pinnacle of human civilization. Billions of people choosing to live and work together. 
In a civilization, everyone has a specific task that helps towards a common goal. Workers, professionals, homemakers, they all come together to build the same society. Above them all, powerful rulers. They command who does what and when and where they do it. But it was not always like this. How this complex system came about has long been a huge puzzle to scientists. For more than a century, surely one of the most important questions addressed by archaeologists is also its biggest. What is the origin of civilization? This has been a central theme, a guiding post for virtually all archaeologists working on every continent of the world. Because civilization was not inevitable. For more than a hundred thousand years, there were neither rulers nor cities. Humanity either roamed the world in small family groupings or lived in tiny villages. There was little planning, little leadership, and no future. Just survival. And then something happened. Six thousand years ago, people started to move out of their villages and built huge cities. Archaeologists call this crossing the Great Divide. This happened in six places across the world. In Egypt, Mesopotamia, China and India. And in the New World in Peru and Central America. Without these pioneers crossing that Great Divide, our modern world would not exist. And what's exciting for us is that here we are in the 21st century living in societies that ultimately are, that ultimately result from that historical change, that historical divide. Archaeologists examined each early civilization in turn, searching for clues as to why they suddenly appeared. And again and again, they found they had many things in common. For instance, numeracy, mathematics, and calendrical systems. Writing. Pottery. Metallurgy. But above all, there was something else. Monumental architecture. In every early civilization, it was the same. Huge, monumental structures. This was the ultimate sign of people coming together under rulers for a common goal. Pyramids marked the arrival of civilization. You can't build a huge structure like that on the basis of consensus. You have to have leaders and followers. You have to have specialists. You have to have people who are in charge, people who can tell individual groups, all right, today you will be doing this. This group, you're going to be doing something different. But none of this explained why our ancestors crossed this historic divide. What had made us give up the simple life for the city? That question still bewitches archaeologists, because to explain it is to understand the very soul of modern humanity. And that's the key question. What, how does that happen? When does it happen? And why does it happen? There were, of course, plenty of theories. Some said it was irrigation. Others, trade. Some claim, even today, it was aliens. But many said it was something else entirely, something terrifying. The theory was simple. Warfare forced groups of villagers to huddle together for protection. This led to new ways of organizing society. Powerful leaders emerged, and these leaders became pharaohs and kings. They would assign tasks and organize lives. Complex society was born 
out of fear. For 20 years, Jonathan Hass and Winifred Kramer have tested the warfare theory around the world. A husband and wife team of archaeologists, they found the telltale signs of battle in every early civilization. As you look at culture, as it becomes more complex, warfare seems to be everywhere. But these societies seem to be always at war, or war is depicted in the art, war is depicted in the architecture. You see a warrior class, or you see standing armies, you see generals. When you get writing, writing is about warfare. While it is not universally accepted, many agree with Hasse's conclusions that warfare was a crucial driving force behind the birth of modern society. I frankly find it difficult to conceive of the emergence of urbanization, complexity, civilization in the absence of degrees of conflict or the presence of, of warfare. But it was only a theory. Archaeologists had no proof. So they spent years scouring the earth, hunting for a way of turning theory into fact. What they needed to find was what archaeologists call a mother city. This is the missing link of archaeology, the very first stage of civilization, just as humanity crossed the Great Divide. So if we could find one of these absolutely earliest stages of civilization, it would make an enormous contribution to our understanding of the process of the development of civilization. If their theory was right, then the mother city should be filled with the signs of battle. But they always hit the same obstacle. Civilizations constantly build upon themselves. It means the earliest stages are all but wiped out. Human beings reconstruct buildings. Human beings recycle materials. It is very often difficult to be able to coax out of that mass of material, that's sort of the base of that civilization, what constitutes the original civilization. After years of searching in the old world, they'd found little. They still needed to find the earliest stage that had not been built on, somewhere pristine. And so the search for the mother city switched from the old world to the new. After years of searching in the old world, they'd found little. They still needed to find the earliest stage that had not been built on, somewhere pristine. And so the search for the mother city switched from the old world to the new. Peru, home to one of the greatest of all civilizations, the Incas. Here, high in the Andean mountains, they ruled a mighty empire until destroyed by the Spaniards 500 years ago. But the origins of this great civilization stretch back thousands of years, and its earliest stages remain shrouded in mystery. And so the search for the mother city settled here, this time on the Peruvian coast, where thousands of years ago, it all began. Seven years ago, the search to find that elusive first stage of civilization arrived here, just 10 miles from the coast in the Casma Valley something truly spectacular was discovered. One of the biggest pyramids in the world. This pyramid is so huge that for a century, explorers ignored it, convinced it could only be a hill. It is the rival of anything in Egypt. 
This is a pyramid that ranks as one of the largest in the world, period. It's one that covers on the surface of the mound, it covers like 15 football fields. The volume of it is, some, we calculate something like 2 million cubic meters of material. But the pyramid was only the beginning. The whole site spreads out over six miles and includes a host of lesser pyramids. In front of the main pyramid, four plazas extend out for over a mile. Thousands of people could have met and done business here. The Kazma Valley is one of the wonders of Peru, and it is a site that reeks of civilization. Visitors of this valley, upon first seeing this pyramid, would have said, this society that built it had its act together. This society is very powerful. This society is, is a society that really is uh, very highly organized. Tom Pazorski and his wife Sheila were about to make Kazma into one of the sensations of archaeology. Because four years ago, they unearthed some wooden poles inside the main pyramid. Wood and be carbon dated. The results showed it had been built in 1500 BC. It made Casma the oldest city ever discovered in the Americas and an instant candidate to be the mother city. Then they dug deeper and everywhere they found the telltale signs of a civilization at its very earliest stage. It was pottery, but it was very simple. And there was art, but again, it was crude. Everything was at its most basic. It all seemed to point to one thing. Kazma had to be the mother city. The final question for the archaeologists was, were the signs of battle? Was it really true that the first civilizations were born out of warfare? Then came the final breakthrough. It happened in one of the outlying pyramids. There, they found some carvings. have warrior figures next to their victims who are cut up, they're beheaded, their bodies cut in half. Heads have blood flowing from their eyes and blood flowing from their mouths. And then you have body parts, so you'll have just a leg and you'll have a torso, or you'll have feet and you'll have crossed hands. For archaeologists like Jonathan Haas, these carvings confirmed what they'd long suspected. Warfare really did seem to be the force that gave birth to civilization. It appeared the answer to why we'd crossed the Great Divide from the simple to the civilized had been found. Archaeology's great quest seemed to have ended at Kazma, the mother city. But Kazma's days as an archaeological sensation were numbered. Just as it was reaching the height of its fame, Ruth Chardy found her mysterious hills. And they would transform everything. Ruth went back to the site again and again, and she took with her a team of students and archaeologists. Their first task? To get a rough idea of how old Karal, as the site was known, actually was. For this, they needed to find pottery, 
because archaeologists are skilled at dating sites just by the style of the pottery they find. But after weeks of searching, they found nothing. Durante dos meses, for two months we looked for pottery. Every night we asked each other if anybody had found any. But nobody had. We were completely baffled. This was very puzzling. Every early civilization is littered with pottery, even Kazma, but not this one. So they looked for something else you'd expect to find in a civilization. Metal tools. But the only tools they found were made not of metal, but stone. There was only one conclusion. This was a civilization at an extraordinarily early stage. Little by little, as we analyzed our findings, we began to realize that this place was completely different to anything we had seen before. And it was much older than we'd expected. But how old? They'd still found nothing they could date. And so they decided to dig inside Corral's biggest structures, the pyramids. This was a massive undertaking. The site was enormous and the pyramids huge. Ruth needed help, so she recruited the army. In their way lay thousands of tons of sand, rubble and stones, built up over millennia. It would have to be shifted, and so as to avoid any damage to the original structures, it could only be done one bucket at a time. Gradually, they caught glimpses of what lay beneath. Some of the original stones, traces of plaster, paint not seen for thousands of years a series of staircases and the wall at the front of the pyramid. There was no doubt these pyramids would have required craftsmen, architects, a huge workforce and leaders. All the trappings of civilization. And then at last, one of her team found what they were looking for. Sticking out of the foundations of one of the buildings were reeds. These reeds had been woven into what are called shikra bags, and the bags clearly had been used to carry the stones from the mountains. It's a technique found only in the very oldest buildings in Peru. Reeds could be carbon dated. It meant that at last Ruth could find out just how old Carral was. But she lacked the facilities to do it herself, and so she sought help from abroad. And so, last year, Jonathan Haas and Winifred Kramer were invited to the site. What they saw stunned them. It was the most incredible assemblage in the, of archaeological sites that we had ever seen anywhere in the world. It was literally one of those double take moments when your mouth drops open and you go, my God, I've never seen anything like that in my life. They had no doubt Corral was a site of potentially huge importance. It made their dating of the Shikra bags all the more crucial. They took 12 samples to the University of Illinois for testing. If the bags were from about 1400 BC, Corral would certainly be an important discovery, but younger than Kazma. Dates around 2000 BC would make it the oldest city in the Americas. Dates any earlier, seemed inconceivable. 
Three months later, the results arrived. I was at work and Jonathan called me and he said, they are absolutely great. They are all early. The bags were dated at 2600 BC. The Raal was nearly 5,000 years old, as old as the pyramids of Egypt, older than anyone had thought possible. I was virtually in hysterics for three days afterwards. Corral was a thousand years older than Kazma. It meant Kazma could not be the city. It had to be Corral. It was now Corral's turn to be a sensation. The new mother city meant archaeologists could at last seek answers to their great question. Why had civilization gone? We've eliminated some of these false starts and blind alleys. We say, okay, this is the point that wherever we look in the world where civilization develops, this happens and this allows for everything else. In the context of archaeology worldwide, it is of major significance. It allows us a new independent laboratory. We can look here for all of those common questions that we ask of every civilization. We have here a unique opportunity, historically a unique opportunity, to look at the start, to look at that transition. To, to, we have our missing link, if you will. Ruth could now show the world what a society looked like at the very dawn of civilization. Her work revealed that at the heart of Corral were six pyramids, arranged around a massive central plaza. Alongside them, an amphitheater and temple, the religious heart of Corral. It contained a furnace, which Ruth believes fired a flame that was meant to burn forever. In the center of the plaza were houses, some ornate, some simple. Dominating everything, the main pyramid, seat of the city's rulers, and the symbol that the people of Corral had left behind the primitive life and discovered civilization. This, then, is what modern society might have looked like at its very beginning. But why was the city here? Why did civilization start at Corral? And that's when the trouble started. It began when Jonathan Haas, the world's expert on the warfare theory, paid another visit. He was searching for evidence to back it up. The first thing he thought he might find were battlements. I began walking and climbing all of the hillsides around Karal. And it finally dawned on me that there weren't any fortifications around these sites. Meanwhile, Ruth and her team were searching Corral for weapons, for depictions of warfare, anything. But again, there was nothing. No encontramos indicadores de armas. We found no sign of the sort of weapons you see in later periods of history, like stone cudgels. No veo evidencias de conflict. I don't see any evidence of conflict. No está the city isn't walled. Its inhabitants did not feel under any threat of war. There are no weapons of war. No hay 
instrumentos de guerra. Haas was now extremely puzzled, so he widened his search. He headed to the valley's mouth, through which any invaders would have had to pass. I was an approaching army. That's where I'd come. And that's where I should find defensive fortifications. There should be a wall going across it. They're easy places to put walls across all of these taxi strings. But again, nothing. There should be something to slow down the enemy. And in fact, there's nothing. There are no fortifications around the Indian Slums. Jonathan Haas was now facing an uncomfortable truth. He had spent years pursuing the theory that warfare was the force that created civilization. And now, it was falling apart in front of him. You seem to really have the beginnings of that complex society. And I'm able to look at it right at the start. And I look for the conflict, and I look for the warfare, and I look for the armies and the fortifications, and they're not there. They should be here, and they're not. And you have to change your whole mindset about the role of warfare in these societies. And so it's demolishing our warfare hypothesis. The warfare hypothesis just doesn't work. The message of Corral was clear. Warfare had nothing to do with the creation of civilization, here at least. The whole quest to find out why civilization was formed would have to start again. The eyes of the world were now on route. Everyone wanted to know what had been going on at Corral. If it wasn't warfare, what was it that brought these people to build their magnificent city? What emerged was that Corral was a society that knew how to have fun. Near the main temple, Ruth and her team found beautifully carved flutes made from the bones of condors. Las flautas. The flutes were the first things we found that showed people working as specialized craftsmen in Corral. But the people of Corral also enjoyed more worldly pleasures. Back in the laboratory, Ruth's team unearthed fragments of the fruit of something called the Achiotti plant. Even today, it's used by rainforest tribes as body paint and food coloring. But it has one other use. To enhance sexual performance. They also found the shells of a creature called the Megabalina snail. These were used as ornaments for necklaces. And inside one of them, they spotted traces of a mysterious white powder. It was lime. The team also found seeds from the coca plant at Corral, and that meant drugs. The lime, when mixed with the coca, enhances the effects of the cocaine in the coca plant. It's a powerful stimulant. There are indications that they use drugs because we have found little containers in which there was some lime. We also found inhalers made out of bone. But these finds told Ruth even more about Corral. The plants, the snail, and even the flutes were a clue to the basis of the whole civilization because they had one other very special quality. 
They were entirely alien to the desert surrounding Corral. They came either from high in the Andes or the rainforest. And that was 200 miles away. All these goods had been brought to Corral from far away. But why? The mystery deepened further. Ruth's team found that Corral didn't just import its pleasures. It also brought in the most basic commodity of all, food. It seemed the staple diet of Corral was completely bizarre for a city deep in the desert. It was fish. There were endless fish bones, mainly of sardines and anchovies. They could only have come from the Pacific coast more than 20 miles away. There was now a real puzzle. Goods of all kinds seemed to be flooding into Corral from all over Peru. Why? What was happening at Corral that drew them there? The mystery of Corral was now captivating Jonathan Haas and Winifred Kramer. Ever since the collapse of the warfare idea, they'd roamed the valleys around Corral hunting for clues for an alternative theory. Their wanderings took them over the hills to the neighboring valleys, and it dawned on them. All the valleys of Corral had one thing in common. Rivers. Even today, Corral is fed by rivers flowing down from the Andes to the sea. These rivers would be the key in unlocking the mystery of why civilization first formed here at Corral. Because with rivers had come a huge technological advance, irrigation. This is the simplest possible kind of irrigation system. All you needed to do was to take a hoe or something like that and um, scratch uh, a little ditch from the river to a piece of land. And you could tell that you were going at the right angle because the water would follow right in. The valleys near Corral are crisscrossed with ancient irrigation trenches. And irrigation would have transformed the desert. Once I bring water off of that river to the Peruvian desert, that desert blooms. Once I get water to it, it just is the most productive land you could possibly hope. Jonathan believed Corral was once a huge Garden of Eden. Here in the middle of the desert, it would have been a vast oasis of fruit and vegetable fields. It would have made Corral one of the wonders of the ancient world. And irrigation led to something else. The thing that would turn out to be the crucial innovation behind the rise of civilization at Corral. Ruth's researchers had begun to look for the kinds of vegetables the people of Corral had been eating. In amongst all the beans and nuts, they found cotton seeds. Lots of them. In fact, cotton seemed to be everywhere. Casi todas las construcciones tienen Practically every building contained cotton seeds or cotton fibers or textiles. We were very surprised at the beginning at the sheer amount of cotton. Some of the cotton was used for clothes, but it had another use that had nothing to do with corral. Fishing nets. 
This net was found at the coast not far from Karal. It's nearly 5,000 years old, as old as Karal itself. It was then that it all became clear to Ruth. Karal was engaged in trade. It made cotton nets for the fishermen who sent fish as payment. A trading link was established between the fishermen and the farmers. The farmers grew the cotton, which the fishermen needed to make the net, and the fishermen gave them, in exchange, shellfish and dried fish. This was Ruth Shani's great insight. Trade in cotton led to a huge, self-sustaining system. Caral made the cotton for the nets. With the nets, the fishermen could catch more food. More food meant more people could live at Caral to grow more cotton. And so, Caral became a booming trading center. And the trade spread. Goods have been found from as far away as Ecuador, the Andes, and of course, the rainforests, hundreds of miles away. There is trade with people in the mountains, the jungle, and also with the coastal people from further away. There is a trading network which is far more widespread than just the internal trade within the valleys around Corral. It seemed then that they'd found the answer to that great archaeological quest. The driving force that led to the birth of civilization at Corral 5,000 years ago was not warfare. It seemed to be trade. Ruth Shadi, the archaeologist from Peru, had cracked it. It looks like exchange is what's unifying this system together and is kind of emerging as the most effective theory we have today to explain how this system developed. And amazingly, this trade seems to have built a contented world. There were no battles, no fortresses. Civilization in Peru appeared to have been born of a time of peace. Or had it? Just as everything seemed to be solved, Ruth's team made a chance discovery that threatened to undermine everything. In one of the grander houses, perhaps home to one of the elite, they spotted something unusual. We thought we had finished work on this section. We looked at the floor and we didn't think there was anything else there. But when we came back the following day, we noticed that there was a slight dip in one section of the floor of the building. At first, they thought they'd found a personal object, perhaps an ornament. When they looked closer, they could see it was a reed basket. It had lain under the floor of a house for nearly 5,000 years. When Ruth cleaned the dust away, she found something much more disturbing inside. Human bone. They'd stumbled upon the body of a small child, perhaps even a baby. It became vital to find out how this child had died. Was it really a victim of some barbaric practice? The body was sent back to the labs for analysis, and with it, the objects found buried alongside. Ruth was surprised to see the baby had been placed in the fetal position before being buried. 
and even more surprised to see the body had been carefully wrapped in several layers of fine cloth. Alongside the body were small stones. They'd been carefully polished and holes drilled through their center. They had to be beads, perhaps of a necklace. Then they examined the bones. They were of a two-month-old baby. And then, slowly, each bone was examined for signs of violence. But there were none. They suspected this child had died of natural causes. It had been lovingly prepared for burial. This first citizen of American civilization was not a sacrifice, but a much-loved child. Corral really had been a city of peace, after all. So this is the real story of Corral. In the desert, a city of pyramids arose, built on riches gained peacefully through trade. It spawned a civilization that lasted unbroken for more than 4,000 years. It is a story that may yet contain the answer to archaeology's greatest question, why human beings crossed the Great Divide from the simple to the civilized. Corral was the first city with the first central government ever to be created. Corral cambia Corral changes all our current thinking about the origins of civilization. Because it seems that 5,000 years ago, they had no need for warfare. Corral enjoyed a peace that lasted almost a millennium. An achievement unmatched in the modern world. That's a period of a thousand years of peace. I can't have a thousand years of peace if warfare is natural to human beings. Warfare is part of human nature. You don't get a millennium of no war. Perhaps that is Corral's real legacy. Human civilization was not born in bloodshed and battle. Warfare was a later part of the human story. Great things can come from peace. Peace.